Hello and welcome to Gastrointestinal Quick Check. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk a little bit about the red flags that help us to be able to determine whether or not our patient is having a GI type of problem. To begin with, obviously, we're going to be assessing, listening to bowel sounds. So over on the right-hand side, you see a picture here of the different quadrants, the different areas of the abdomen, and what kind of organs underneath might be assessed by listening in those areas. So that you can see, we can hear a lot of different stuff going on in the abdomen. If you're looking for a specific problem, say, for example, a small bowel obstruction, then we should be looking in a specific area. When we're listening to bowel sounds, there's a lot of confusion about what creates or what is a hyperactive bowel sound and what is a hypoactive or absent bowel sound. Typically, we'd say that hypoactive bowel sounds are bowel sounds that are occurring once every one to three minutes, okay, so not very frequently. Absent bowel sounds, we'd have to be listening for a long time. So if we're having one bowel sound in every three minutes, we'd have to be listening for a long time to hear an absent bowel sound. On the other hand, hyperactive bowel sounds may be five or more per minute. So we'll be having bowel sounds that are very frequent. Abdominal firmness is another characteristic we're looking for as a red flag. We'll talk about what that means, and we're going to assess the bowel sounds, the hematocrit in association with the BUN, and our fluids and electrolytes. So again, talking about bowel sounds, first of all, as the box below signifies, bowel sounds have a low specificity for identifying GI problems because there's a wide variance in people's normal bowel sounds. So maybe after you eat would be a time when you'd have very hyperactive bowel sounds uh, during sleeping and maybe in the early morning hours, maybe very hypoactive bowel sounds. So we have to be careful about interpreting what we're hearing from our bowel sounds. Certainly it is a characteristic and they are associated with disease processes, but they are not very specific to being able to identify whether our patient has a process such as an ileus, a bowel obstruction, bowel infarction, or maybe maybe peritonitis. Let's take a look at some of those. So with an ileus, we have decreased motility of the bowel that's occurring. Our bowel may be obstructed. It may be that the ileus is caused by just decreased motility from the patient using narcotics. It's slowed the, the GI system down. The patient may be constipated, so it may be hard stool that is slowing down the entire process here. So there may be a mechanical obstruction. This is another type of mechanical obstruction here where the bowel is actually kind of looped over itself. Oftentimes this will happen in patients who have some irritable bowel disease or in patients who have chronic constipation. There can be inflammation that is causing the bowel to become obstructed. So our patients with ulcerative colitis or our patients who have Crohn's disease, those are situations where we get a chronic inflammation, which then causes swelling and scar tissue formation in the bowel. A bowel infarction, and we see over on the right-hand side here, a bunch of bowel that is infarcted. And it's really dark in color, not the nice bright pink color we would expect it to, to look like. It's also very swollen. So there's a, a bunch of processes that go on as a result of this ischemia, injury, and necrosis that occurs with a bowel infarction. So very much like an cardiac infarction or myocardial infarction, we'd see an atherosclerotic disease process that is causing decreased blood flow, which then causes ischemia, injury, and necrosis. Three things are going to then happen to the bowel. We're going to have the leaking of the bowel contents into the vasculature. Okay, this could potentially seed the patient with bacteria. This can also lead to peritonitis because that section of the bowel is going to be very friable and very likely to be able to burst. Those things can lead to sepsis, septic shock, etc. So we do need to be very careful about bowel infarction. With bowel infarction, that area of bowel that is infarcted will no longer have any 
motility. So it's going to be quiet. There's not going to be any noise at all. There's not going to be any bowel sounds in that area. Peritonitis can be caused by any of the above. So this is a situation where the peritoneal membrane becomes in, inflamed or infected, and uh, this is going to cause the patient to have severe abdominal pain. Usually peritonitis is the result of having some kind of abdominal condition. So it's usually there's an underlying condition, maybe a bowel infarction or a rupture of the bowel, maybe a appendix that's ruptured, something like that has occurred, and that has caused the, in, caused the inflammation of the peritoneum. As you can see from the picture on the right, the peritoneum covers the entire abdominal cavity. This is the lining of the abdominal cavity. And when that becomes irritated, the patient is going to have severe pain. They're going to be guarding their abdomen, trying to protect it. And they're going to have tenderness and rigidity of the abdominal muscles. So that irritation is going to cause involuntary muscle contraction to try to protect the abdomen from further injury. Moving the peritoneal cavity is going to cause additional pain. It's going to cause additional discomfort. So if the patient were to cough, if the patient were to flex their hips, uh, one of the things that we've all learned how to do is Bloomberg sign, which is when you press down on the abdomen and you remove your hand quickly, that rebound pain, that rebound type of pain is the result of the peritoneal membrane snapping back into place, and that's going to cause pain to the patient. We also want to look at the hematocrit and BUN in relationship to each other. Let's take a look at the first one. In the first case, the hematocrit drops, the BUN drops. That is caused by fluid overload. In the second case, we have a drop in the hematocrit, but an increase in the BUN. Okay, that's indicative of a GI bleed. The third case, we have an increase in hematocrit and an increase in BUN, and that is associated with dehydration. Okay, let's talk about why case number two there, the GI bleed, occurred. We have a drop in our hematocrit, the patient's bleeding. Okay, that makes sense. Patient's bleeding, hematocrit's going to drop. But the BUN increases as a result of having bleeding into the gastrointestinal tract. So the GI tract is going to digest the blood, the urea nitrogen is going to be reabsorbed, and that's why we see the increase in BUN. So if you have a patient who is dropping their hematocrit and you don't know where the blood is going, take a look at that BUN. If the BUN is going up at the same time that the hematocrit's going down, it could very well be a GI bleed. Now to differentiate this increase in BUN from an increase in BUN caused by a kidney disease, we're going to also look at the creatinine. So if the BUN is elevated, look at the creatinine. If the creatinine is normal, then this would indicate the patient has a GI bleed. If the creatinine is also elevated, we'd have to be looking at some renal dysfunction. Well, thank you for joining me for a gastrointestinal quick check. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.